morning. Happy Meta. I want to welcome our visitors this morning. If you're new to our parish and would like to join our parish, today's greeters are Donna Ambos, and uh, there's Donna back there, and Jeannie Ninos, who I also saw right up in front. And our ambassador today is Carol Hopkins. We can see Carol somewhere here. Um, but if you fill out one of the white connection cards in the pews and hand it to either Donna or Jeannie or Carol, they'll get you connected to our church community, get you on the mailing list and stuff. And uh, I especially want to welcome Father Stratton Dorzinski and his wife, uh, Denise, who are visiting us from Detroit, Michigan. They have a, a grandchild who's going to be in church today and receive the 40 day blessing after the liturgy. And it's uh, wonderful to have you present that. I have Father here with us. Come again anytime. <laughs> um, and of course, Father Michael and Father Catherine are here with us. So wonderful to have three priests in the altar. For those who have been here for a long time, you know that 95% of the time I'm alone in the altar. So Today, the, the bank was very nice because the, the room was very full. Um, a couple of announcements to make. Um, we are going to have Divine Liturgy this Wednesday evening, um, a double feast. We're going to have the Feast of St. Catherine Wednesday night instead of Wednesday morning. We're going to have the service for St. Catherine Wednesday night and also for Thanksgiving uh, Wednesday night at 6 o'clock or at 5 o'clock. Many of you come. Uh, for this service in May, going to liturgy part of our Thanksgiving holiday. Um, the word Thanksgiving, Ephratistia in Greek, is the same word that we use for Eucharist. The Eucharist is the Thea Ephratistia, the Holy Thanksgiving. And so years ago, our special Diago said, because we're in the middle of the fasting season, um, if you want to have a dispensation, have meat, have turkey, and Dallas Cowboys on Thursday, which is what all of us do. Um, come and have the Thea Ephratistia Wednesday night, have the Holy Thanksgiving Wednesday night, or Thursday morning we do Wednesday night here, and then have our have our church and football Thanksgiving on Thursday, but keep Christ in this very, very important feast. So we'll have the high letters on Wednesday at 6. Um, the, uh, the other announcement is that um, you probably got in the, in the uh, email, constant contact this week, as well as in the bulletin, a letter about the St. Nicholas Shrine in New York. Um, if you are interested in donating to that, what is not apparent is that we want all the donations to come into St. Into John's, and then we will just send one large check from our community up there, rather than sending many, many small checks there. So if you are interested in that, um, bring, send your check to the church office, bring it to the church, give it to me, um, and then we'll make one large check and we'll send it up to New York on behalf of our church. The reason I'm asking that is because they're actually, they're actually tracking um, what each church is giving. So uh, they're, they're going to say, you know, Father, you didn't participate in this. So bring them here so that they can track our church uh, correctly. What am I holding in my hands right now? All right. What, how much is this worth? It's empty, by the way. How much is this worth? Priceless? Actually, it's empty, so it's worth about probably a couple thousand dollars. But if I took it to a pawn shop, I doubt I would get even that, because this, outside of the liturgical context, is not worth very much. I mean, if I gave this to you and said, take it home to your home, I mean, what would you use it for? Right, so the value of the chalice is when it's full. And when the chalice is full, then the value is priceless. If you actually think about this, what is the value of this? Or what is this? This is the ticket to heaven. This is the path to our salvation. That's what this is. Empty, sitting on a shelf, is a nice museum piece. If I gave it to you to put in your house, it would be a nice something for people to stare at. Be worth for nothing. But filled with the body and blood of Christ, this is the most precious thing that there is in the world. This is our ticket to salvation. A few years ago, the, uh, the Lightning, the Tampa Bay Lightning, uh, actually last year, when they were in the Stanley Cup and you would watch the playoffs and they would say, you know, it's all about the cup, is the marketing tool. And in the Orthodox Church, in the, in the Christian faith, it is all about the cup. The cup is the beginning and the end of everything. If 
we take this cup and we celebrate liturgy in another place, you can still have the liturgy. But if you take the cup out of the church and we say there is no chalice, there is no body and blood of Christ, there is no communion, then the whole church falls apart. Because the whole church begins and ends on this cup. It's the most valuable thing that we have. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. When you think about the purpose of the church, what is the church here for? The, the role of the priest is to hold the cup. Somebody has to do that. If you don't have anybody to do that to impart the body and blood of Christ to people, then again, there is no church. But if you have no people to impart the body and blood of Christ to, you have no church. So in the church, the priest holds the cup, and the job of everybody else is to get as many people to the cup as possible. To get as many people to the cup as possible. Jesus said when he left his disciples and gave the great commission in Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 to 20, he said, Go therefore and baptize all nations. Get this cup to as many people as possible. Everybody should be a partaker of the cup because the cup, again, is the, is the ticket to paradise. Now, why is it that we come to Divine Liturgy every Sunday? If you look in the, in the Red Liturgy book, take the Red Liturgy book out of the pews for a minute. And turn to page 21 at the very bottom. This is a prayer that the priest is offering that many times you can't hear unless you're listening really closely. So the priest says, Take heed, this is my body which is broken for you for the remission of sins. And then he takes the cup and he says, Drink of this all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then he continues the prayer, remembering, therefore, this commandment of the Savior and all that came to pass for our sake. The cross, the tomb, the resurrection of the third day, the ascension into heaven, the enthronement at the right hand of the Father, and the second and glorious coming. So when we're coming to divine liturgy, we're coming to remember all those things. Now, I don't know about you, but the world and my life is so busy that I forget about these things. We've all read ad nauseum, and really it's ad nauseum, in the papers that speak about all the awful things that are happening in the world. Not a day goes by that you don't pick up something that's awful. Not a day you don't go, goes by that you don't experience something that's frustrating. And so we have, I don't know about you, but I have a short memory. So coming to church on Sundays and receiving from the cup and going through this service of the Divine Liturgy, it's an opportunity for me to remember in case I forget during the week, remembering all that came to pass for my sake, that Jesus died for me, that he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, he sat at the right hand of the Father, and there is a second and glorious coming that's going to be really, really good for the followers and really, really bad for those who are not followers. And right, and then if you, if you flip the page, or actually stay on page 22 at the bottom, after we consecrate the gifts, there are six reasons listed here as for why we receive communion. We receive communion for six reasons, at least, so that they, these gifts, so that they may be to those who partake of them for vigilance of soul, forgiveness of sins, communion of the Holy Spirit, fulfillment of the kingdom of heaven, confidence before you, and not in judgment or condemnation. So that they may be to those who receive them for vigilance of soul, so that my soul this week vigilant and it's not depressed no matter what I read in the paper, no matter what happens to me in my life, so that I'm vigilant so that my sins can be forgiven. Again, there's not one week or even one day that goes by that I don't sin. That I may enjoy a communion with the Holy Spirit. It is not just being in the presence of all of you, but being in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Fulfillment of the Kingdom of Heaven. If I do this enough and I remember this enough, one day I will stand in the kingdom of heaven. 
that I may have confidence before God, that I may not wonder and be stressed out, what is my Christian life like, because I'm receiving Christ all the time, and that I may receive not in judgment or condemnation, not in disappointment to God, but that God likes my company, and that I like his company. So these are the reasons why we come to the Divine Liturgy on Sunday. And again, the reason we have the church is so that we can receive from the cup, and the role of the priest is to hold the cup, and the role of the people is to get as many people to the cup as possible. And we get people to the cup in different ways. We need to have people that sing, because the singing tugs at the heartstrings of our hearts. It brings out emotion in people. We need people to serve in the altar. We need people to direct the order of our parish, the ushers of our worship. We need people to direct the order of our parish, the parish council, to make sure there's a building in which I can hold the cup, to make sure that it is air-conditioned, and to make sure that the sound works. And we need people like the Philoptokos to go and, and tell the poor people about the cup and bring them in. And we need the Sunday school teachers to go and teach our children about the cup. I think you get where I'm going with this. We need people, but we need them to support the mission of the church, which is the cup itself. That's the only reason that we're here. You take that out, there is no church. We don't exist so that we can all have coffee next door. Because you can do that at Starbucks. You don't need to come here for that. All right? We don't exist in order to help the poor. That is part of what we do. But that's not the only reason that we're here. You can be an atheist and go help the poor. We exist here in order to partake of the cup and in order to bring as many people to the cup as possible. Now, part of this, part of this, it involves a financial outlay. Part of this involves a, an outlay of time and of talent. Now, I hope that you all receive the stewardship information in the mail this week. You all receive the stewardship information? You remember what I asked last Sunday? Please, for me, spend a half hour reading the stewardship information. If you didn't do that, it's okay. You have two weeks to read it. But please take a half an hour and please do it for me. If no other reason, please do it for me. And read through the information. Now, there is always this, I don't know, <clears throat> hesitancy to talk about what we give to the church in monetary terms. And the, and the church is very um, unoriginal in our, in our play selection. Everywhere you go, there's always, you know, a train. There's always a fundraiser. There's always, like, throwing up a Hail Mary pass. Like, I hope someone will give what we need. And we're always playing, like, from behind. Right? That's not the way that we're supposed to do it. Right? Based on some demographic information that I received from our, our stewardship and our finance committee, based on some demographic information I received, I'm, I'm estimating that everybody gives an average of 2% per, two of their income to the church. 2%. And from that 2%, we were able to raise about $400,000 a year. Now, if everybody gave 3%, if everybody gave 3% of their money, we would raise $600,000, which would be just enough to meet, would be just about enough to meet our whole budget. If everybody gave 4%, we would crush our budget, and we'd be able to fix everything that's wrong here. And if we got up to 5%, we could expand the ministries of the church. We could offer more money in order to get the cup to people. And if we gave 10%, and the $400,000 became $2 million, we could take 200000 of that and give it right to the poor. So we could take 10% of that and give it right to the poor, which is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to give 10% of our money to God, and the church is supposed to give 10% of its money to help the poor. But we don't do that. We give about 2% of our money to God, and the church gives about 2% of its money to the poor. Right, imagine if every, every Christian gave 10% and every church gave 10% to the poor, then you wouldn't have all these charities out there. So the church is supposed to take care of the charity. The reason why the government's doing it is because we're not doing it ourselves. But let me leave that for a moment. I would guess, conservatively, that at least a couple hundred thousand dollars leaves the pockets of our people and goes to licensed clinical therapists. I'm guessing. A couple hundred thousand, that's probably a conservative estimate. If we had a $2 million income coming in, we just hire an Orthodox therapist here. And then instead of going to a secular therapist and, and getting secular ideas, you'd have an Orthodox therapist that would be trained in to teach you, but also have the compassion to pray with you and to minister to you in an Orthodox way. Right? Now, 
I'm not haranguing people. I hope you don't think that I'm haranguing you. And I'm not talking, you know, a fantasy either. If we want to be what the church is supposed to be, then we have to get past this, let's spend all year just trying to make enough money to just keep the doors open. Right? And the way that it starts is by keeping people making a sacrificial commitment. I'm not asking for 10%. I wouldn't dream of that right now. But if we could take our stewardship from 2% to 3%, then we could take the festival out of the budget, we could pay off our existing debt in a few years, and then we would have that debt gone, the festival money, the rent from the school, and we would have probably $250,000 coming in here that again could be used to augment the ministries of our church, to get more people to the cup. How beautiful it was to have three priests today, three cups. It went so fast today. I mean, how beautiful is that? And how beautiful would it be to have three priests sitting here listening to confession and counseling? Visiting the sick more often than I'm able to. Right? Let's, I'm not thinking about three priests. Let's start with two. And then have more than one before we get three. But I mean, this is what you want, this is what we want to think about as a church. Right? It's not even just about us growing, but it's about ministering correctly to the people we already have. My gosh, if everybody called me every week for some inspiration, I wouldn't have time to take all those phone calls. I mean, imagine if we had more people we could do that. But we got to grow the church. we got to bring the cup to more people. So, in the Bible this morning, and it's sort of, I don't know, providential that we read these passages at this time of the year. There's a rich man, and he was so rich, and it's not his fault that he was rich. That's not, the, that's not his crime. But he just didn't, he had all these things, he didn't need them. And he said, you know, i got this problem with all these things, I don't need them. I would just tear down my house and I'll build a bigger house. And then I have a place to store all my stuff. And then I'll sit back and I'll say, oh, thank God, my soul is, is ready for years and years and years. He says, soul, take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. And God said, you're a fool. The eating and drinking may be merry, making merry, that, that may be worse for your body, but your soul does not grow, does not become anything because you're eating and drinking and being merry. Your soul grows when we are growing toward Christ. And God said, by the way, you're a fool, because tonight your soul is required of you. Tonight you're going to die. And all those things you have, whose will those things be? Really, you can't take them with you. I've done hundreds of funerals. They're all the same. It's a little box with a person in it. There are no belongings in there. Once in a while, someone will throw some money in there, which I think is ridiculous. Because you can't spend it where you're going. You don't need the money. You don't take any possessions. Nobody does. The only thing we take with us is our soul and the record of it. So when I make my pledge in two weeks, and our church is Sunday is December 6th, when I make my pledge in two weeks, I'm not pledging to hit an average. I'm not pledging toward a goal. In fact, we're going to take the thermometer down. We're not going to have a goal for next year. I'm not pledging toward that. I'm not pledging toward the average. I'm not looking at the average of everybody else. I'm not looking at what anybody else is doing. I'm pledging to the cup. In fact, I actually have this idea, maybe I will bring the bigger challenge we have and tell people who the pledge for is right in there. Because that's what you're pledging to. You're pledging to Christ and to the cup and saying, this is what I want to give so that the cup can go to as many people as possible. And if you can barely keep the, the roof on our church, then the cup barely survives for our congregation. But if we can expand our thinking and expand our ministries, then the cup comes to more people. And that's what it's all about. It's all about the cup. It's all about the cup. It starts and ends there. Every year, from the time we were moving lens, President Ted and I have, have made, made, started making a small plan. And every year we make a, sm a small increase, and a small increase, and a small increase, and a small increase, until now our pledge is pretty good size. And we're working our way to 10%. I want to end up at 10%, because that's where God wants us. We're not going to be at 10% this year. We're working our way there. We're well over 6%, and we're working our way to 10%. But we started little, and we go a little more, a little more, a little more. We don't look at our expenses. We don't look at inflation. We don't look at what anybody else is doing. We look at us and the cup, and that's when we make our pledge. And I'm asking you to read over the material, to prayerfully think this over, and if everybody gave 3% of their income, and some of you do give more. Some of you, there are people here who tithe, and I'm very, very appreciative of that. And if you can keep doing that, that's wonderful. But if everybody gave 3%, and if everybody gave some money in their will toward the church, we would take that cup and we would, we would make the church much bigger and we would have more cups and more people and more people coming to Christ. And isn't that what we need? I mean, look at, the, look at the paper every day. There's no cup in there. 
and there's always people who are angry and upset and stressed out because they don't have the cup. So we can make a difference in the world. I close with that story of the starfish you all know. You know about the starfish on the beach, and the, little, and the young boy is going and throwing the starfish back in the water because if the starfish are on the beach, they die. And there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of starfish, and the little boy throw, is throwing them back into the water one at a time, and a cynical old man comes up to him and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm saving starfish. I'm throwing them back into the water one at a time. And the old man says, what kind of difference can you make? You're one boy, there's thousands of starfish. And the kid throws the starfish and he goes, I made a difference for that one. And we're not going to save the world here. No way. We're, we're a few hundred people. There's billions of people out there. A lot of them don't know Christ. A lot of them are keyed off and mad and want to blow things up. We're not going to stop all that. But we can make a difference. We can make a difference. And we're not going to make a difference if we're just trying to keep ourselves going every year so we can turn the calendar into it next year. So let's get ahead. Let's get ahead. And let's go make a difference. It's all about the cup. It starts and ends there. Amen. So, you know, enthused in what I'm saying, I forgot to say one important thing. It's Happy Thanksgiving. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. I'm thankful that I'm here, and I'm thankful for all of you, and I'm thankful you come to worship, that you come to receive the cup, and that you listen to my, my speeches, and you don't, you know, throw things. So, thank you. <laughs> have a happy Thanksgiving. because of you. You really did such a beautiful job. Uh, him, the hymns of the church sang so beautifully spiritually. Clear diction could understand you in Greek and in English. We know how special it is if you go visit other parishes. Um, to the altar boys who just were so reverent within the altar, my goodness, it was such a beautiful experience. You're so blessed to be members of this community. Uh, to share as a family here at St. John's. Certainly, it, it pays testament to Father Stavros and his love and his ministries to all of you, which is unending and bountiful, and certainly the synergy that you can obviously see with the parish council together and leadership leading this community. You all are very, very blessed. May, may I just say thank you for allowing us to be here, and I think Father being able to share with Father Michael, and certainly, be thankful for being members of this beautiful St. John community at Thanksgiving amongst the many things we have. Again, thank you for your hospitality. Father well, Zonaldi, one of the uh, most well accomplished priests in the Archdiocese, one of the tallest. So. <laughs> I had to bring my own investments. I couldn't buy our fathers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not lucky. I look up to him for many reasons. 